looks like we're getting live on Facebook now. All right. So um, welcome everyone to the Fire in the Pines virtual speaker series. This is the third one that we've done this week. They've been They've all been super diverse and um, we've had some really great speakers so far. I'm really excited for this speaker, um, Monica Rother. She's with UNCW here in Wilmington. She's also done, done really great work all across the Southeast landscape in Longleaf. So really excited to hear from her. Um, as a part of Fire in the Pines, we are an environmental educational festival dedicated to spreading positive awareness around control burning and its importance in the Longleaf landscape. Um, there's so many native plants and animals that depend on fire and uh, fire is just such a vital part of creating those unique niche habitats for both plants and animals and Monica can tell us a little bit more about that across the landscape. Um, if you guys are local to Wilmington, we have some really cool events happening around town. Um, if you're remote, we have an iNaturalist scavenger hunt that you can join from wherever you are and a photo contest too. Those, um, those are on our website if you need more information on that. We have tons of swag to give out, tons of really cool prizes, so be sure to check our website out. All right, well, I will kick it over to our speaker, Monica, if you want to go ahead and get started. All right. Hi, everyone. I will go ahead and share my screen. I have some slides to show you today. Oh, that looks weird on my end. What does it look like for you guys? Um, it's just black right now. It says Monica has started screen sharing. Hmm. Let's try this one. Can you see my screen yet? Yes, I can see your screen and it's just in like, um, it's not in presenter mode yet. It's just, uh, we see your presentation. Hmm. Let me try one more time. Might be, I think it's because I have more than one thing. Oh, I think I know why. Okay, sorry about that, just a second. That was a great picture. Does that look good now? Just the title slide? Um, I think it's going to load here in a minute. It just says Monica started screen sharing. Oh, there you go. So I can see the title slide. Yep. Wonderful. OK, well, thank you again, everyone, from, for joining. I'm so excited about Fire in the Pines this year and that it's virtual. I see my dad is actually in the audience. How cool is that? <laughs> Very exciting. But I know most of, most of you are joining us from here in Wilmington, and we will talk a lot about the local landscape and talk about tree rings, fire, and especially longleaf pine. So first, the most basic thing to start with that everyone you know, should pull from this festival and from this talk is that fire can be a very good thing. So we know, first of all, that fire is natural. It's been here on earth for a really long time. It would be here in the future with or without us. It's going to be happening on earth. It's a natural process. Also, putting out fires too much, now sometimes we have to, to try to protect you know, human life and human property, but putting out fire all the time rather than allowing it to burn or even starting fires in a safe situation can be undesirable. So it can hurt the environment and it can, it can actually cause things to be more dangerous for people as well. So we use prescribed fire or prescribed burning to improve the environment, particularly in landscapes that are supposed to have a lot of fire like our longleaf pine ecosystems. So we've been seeing a lot more conversation about the good side of fire over the last couple of decades. Even Smokey Bear, who once was completely against all fire, he's come around. And now if you go to the Smokey Bear website, you can learn all about fire ecology and how fire can really benefit a lot of our environments. So I like to start with this really general question and let you guys kind of think about it. How long have we had fire on Earth? Does fire really go back to the beginning of Earth's history? What do you need for fire would be another follow-up question. So many people, especially this image, might make you think, yes, there were volcanoes. Those were probably starting fires. But actually, for fire to occur, we need three elements. Many of you are familiar with the fire triangle oxygen, heat, and fuel. 
And in early Earth's history, we had that heat, that ignition source, but we didn't have enough oxygen in our atmosphere. And we also didn't have terrestrial plants. So we didn't have that fuel, that the thing that's needed in order to allow the fire to burn. So we don't have fire for all of Earth's history, but we do have fire for a very long time. And in this image here, you see a very fiery period in Earth's history, the Carboniferous. This was also a time of giant invertebrates, like giant centipedes, as you see here in the imagery. This was a time when we started to see plants emerging with bark, like our pine trees that we have today. And that fuel really allowed a lot of fires to burn. We also had very high oxygen levels in the atmosphere, even higher than they are today. So in terms of when we first see fire on Earth, it doesn't go back to the very beginning, but it goes back about 440 million years ago. That's what we know so far, maybe even a little bit further. But essentially, once we start to see a lot of plants on Earth's surface, we start to see fire. Now, why is that important? Well, that explains why so many plants and animals today and through Earth's history benefit from fire because they've coexisted with fire for a long time. So they understand fire, they are used to fire, and some of them even depend on fire, as in without fire, they don't do well. My favorite example, and this isn't from our area, we'll start broader, we'll start with an Australian example, are black kites. So this bird of prey, which means that, you know, it eats things like rodents, uh, it has been long known to hunt around fires and try to think about why that might happen. The fire is scaring out the prey. And, and so we've, we've seen these black kites picking off food from around a fire. And a lot of birds and other predators have been known to do that. But the black kites go one step further and have been seen to actually start fire. So they pick up little pieces of burning twigs and drop them down in grass that's not yet on fire and spread fire, which is really amazing because we always thought that only humans could manipulate fire, but we now know uh, some wildlife species may be doing that too. Okay, so let's zoom in on our longleaf pine ecosystems. So many interesting and wonderful examples, but I'll highlight three for you here of species that thrive with fire. So the first, the iconic longleaf pine. There are many different ways in which fire is adapted to do well, or longleaf is adapted to do well with fire and, and requires fire. But the one that I highlight here is the very beginning. So in order for the seeds not to just germinate, but to also survive, they need what's called bare mineral soil, which is after a fire has moved through an area, it burns up um, all of the vegetation and litter, or at least a large portion of it on the ground surface. That creates the perfect little soil bed, essentially, for the seeds to germinate and survive. So we know that longleaf pine germinates well after a fire. Red cockaded woodpeckers are really neat species. These are the only woodpeckers that uh, make their habitat in live trees as opposed to dead trees. And they specifically love old longleaf pine, open conditions where the trees are really widely spaced. So a healthy longleaf pine system that's supported by lots of fire is, is, the, is the system where we find our red cockaded woodpeckers. They do great in that habitat. If there's not fire in a longleaf system for long enough, these birds disappear. And then lastly, wiregrass. This is a species that many of you might know if you spend time hiking around in the woods. We, we see a lot of this. Um, it's a bunch grass. You can see the little bundles of it there in the imagery. And what we've learned about this grass is that its reproduction, just like longleaf, is tied to fire. So it produces seed only when burned and actually when it's burned during the growing season or during the summer or maybe late spring, it needs uh, that specific kind of fire in order to produce its seed. So I just gave you a few examples. Um, another key connected theme here when we think about fire in longleaf pine systems is that fire, you know, we often think of it as a destructive force, but it's actually what promotes biodiversity in these systems. So thanks to frequent fire, we have these systems that have just so many different species. And what we like to say in longleaf pine systems is that you have to look down. And that's because if you look out at the trees, you might only see longleaf and a few other tree species. 
But if you look down, you'll see dozens of species in the understory. A place near Wilmington, about an hour from here, um, the Green Swamp, a beautiful place that is known to have over 17 species or 17 species of carnivorous plants, the most famous of which the Venus flytrap, but we have sundews and pitcher plants, all sorts of different species there. And different science has shown uh, different levels of biodiversity, but they often find dozens of species in just one square meter, a very small space. So an amazing place to visit, but make sure you look down and don't miss what's on the ground. The wave track, is another site like that in Georgia. The total area, which is about 200 acres, has almost 400 different species. And these are plant species almost entirely in that understory. Amazing. Now, a key theme here, so we see the fire burning on the wave track, is that fire does not kill the plants. It just removes the above ground material or biomass, as it's often called. The roots survive and the plants come back again. So fire does not kill all of these understory plants. It just you know, temporarily removes that above ground mass and then it comes back after the fire, often very quickly. So here uh, in Wilmington and actually throughout the Southeastern Coastal Plain, you can see it there on the map. This whole area is known as a biodiversity hotspot. And biodiversity hotspots, if you don't know, are areas, areas that have high species richness and also are in jeopardy. So they've been largely lost or destroyed due to human activity. So these are places that we want to prioritize for conservation. And if we think about the southeastern coastal plain, we have a huge number of different ecosystems that occur here and not all of them are meant to burn super frequently but a vast majority of this area um, is meant to have fire on the landscape. And particularly where longleaf pine occurred, which was a large swath of this Southeastern coastal plain, we expect fires to have happened every few years for many millennia. So frequent fire areas tend to have high biodiversity is what I'm getting at uh, in this slide. Okay, so how do we connect all of this to tree rings and how do we use tree ring science to learn about fire? First, just a really big, you know, general introduction to dendrochronology, what that is. Dendrochronology is the study of trees, but also through time. So we use that tree ring element, not to just look at the environment now, but to look at the environment back through time, tree ring science. So what kinds of things we, can we do? Most everyone here probably knows that you can determine how old a tree is by counting its rings, right? So that's one of the most basic applications. Uh, but dendrochronology can also be used to study climate and climate change. And it's one of the biggest sources of data for our current understanding of how climate has changed over the last few hundred years, thousands of years. The time scale can vary, but a very important source of information about past climate. There's also a lot of fun applications related to human history. So we can date uh, old buildings. Uh, we can date musical instruments to see, is this really the place that maybe Abe Lincoln was born, for example? Or is this really an instrument created by this famous artist and used by this person? We can use the tree ring dating to confirm or, or refute that information. Really old paintings, we can date the wooden frames. And then in my branch of tree ring science, we look at natural disturbances. So those are things that change the ecosystem temporarily, uh, such as beetle outbreaks and other insect outbreaks and wildfires, which is uh, you know, a, big, a big part of what I do. Okay, so looking at this, uh, this is a prescribed fire down in Georgia. Um, you can see this is actually a longleaf pine system. There's some other pine species there as well. But um, that fire, it looks like it's burning pretty hot, but it's not getting up into the treetops. And these trees have nice thick bark. It keeps them protected from this fire. So these, this fire is unlikely to be killing any of the grown trees in this forest. However, sometimes that doesn't mean it can't create a slight injury. So some of these fires, if they burn hot enough 
And, and if they stay in an area for long enough, they can cause little small injuries to the tree that, that don't hurt it in the long term, but leave behind some evidence of that fire. So here's an example. This tree actually did get a pretty significant wound there, but it's it survived many different fires through time, even with that open wound. So these fire scarred trees can document the location. They tell you a fire happened right here, the year, and even the season. Was it in the summer? Was it in the winter? We can get all of that information from the tree rings. So let's zoom in and look at fire scars. So not every fire will scar every tree. So that's why when we look at these types of data sets, we need to collect information from many different trees on the landscape. But, but fire scars are similar to what, you know, you think about with a person having a scar on their skin, this is an injury that has healed. And in trees, we're talking about a lesion caused by part of the cambium dying due to the heat of the fire. So why would we wanna do this? Why is it important to understand the history of fire in a given location? Well, that's because if we're going to start helping our ecosystems through using prescribed fire more frequently, we need to understand how much fire and at what time of year we should be burning a given landscape. We know that longleaf pine is supposed to burn very frequently. You hear different numbers, but definitely you know, less than five years between each fire and maybe even a lot less than that. But it's probably not just a uniform recipe. And what I mean by that is that maybe longleaf that's occurring in slightly wetter or cooler locations further north or at higher elevations, maybe it burns a little less frequently than uh, other environments. So we need to kind of dig into the data to better understand exactly what uh, occurred. Also, how much variability was there historically? Did fires happen, you know, like clockwork or was it, were there long stretches without fire followed by stretches of very frequent fire? These are the kinds of things we can dig into with the tree ring record. So the goal of the research really is to help inform land management and specifically using prescribed fire to restore ecosystems. Uh, many people have done this type of research, but what you're seeing here is just how biased, not on purpose, but how biased the data are towards the Western US. So we have many more studies of this type being completed in the Western US, in places like our Ponderosa pine ecosystems, um, even down in Mexico and up into Canada, but very sparse in the Eastern US. And this includes in our longleaf pine ecosystems. So why don't we have those data in the Eastern US? We definitely have pinelands and, and they burn. So why don't we have that information? Well, there's many different reasons. Part of it is because the first scientists to develop this, these techniques a few decades ago were out West. So these methods just were first figured out that we could do this. Uh, in the southwestern U.S. especially. And there continues to be a lot more tree ring scientists that live in the western U.S. So it's just a consequence of where there are people who are interested in that type of work. Uh, another big part of it is that there's not a lot of wood out there for the studies. So you might have learned that longleaf pine, the distribution or where it used to occur, um, is, is much smaller than it once was. You often hear 3% of longleaf is left from the original 100%. And there's just not a lot of wood, a lot, not a lot of places that we can go to to collect the, the data that we need. And then lastly, um, longleaf is so fire adapted with its nice thick bark and, and other adaptations and the fires tend to be um, not too intense, not too hot. So for a long time, researchers just didn't really think that you could do this type of work in longleaf pine because they didn't think that you could find those scars. So we've just been starting to do these types of studies in the last probably 10 years, maybe even a little less than that, uh, just starting to, to scratch the surface on this research. So how do we do this? First of all, maybe I should have put this in earlier in case you guys were scared that I was cutting down all the live trees. We don't cut down live trees for this research. We, we use dead material. 
So remnants, that's just a little bit of wood that you, you don't know even necessarily what part of the tree it is sometimes, but wood we find on the ground. Stumps, that tends to be what I collect the most of. Um, and then sometimes we collect from snags, and that's a fancy way of saying a standing dead tree. So we collect dead wood uh, for this research. Then we take the big stump or whatever we have back to the laboratory and we slice it up on a bandsaw to make, they're sometimes cutely called cookies. You see the little round section there or cross sections we could call them. So we slice them up and we sand them um, using lots of different grits of sandpaper. It gets really shiny. It almost looks like a polished piece of wood. And then we're ready to analyze the rings. So we scan the rings on a high resolution scanner and then we use specialized tree ring software and specialized methods that I don't have time to dive into to be certain that we assign the exact year to every ring in that tree. So we date each and every ring. We use statistical methods to make sure that we've done that correctly. And then once we've dated each ring, we can go in and date the fire scars. So here you can see a fire scar that dates to 1758. And I can tell based on the position right at the beginning of the ring that this is a winter scar. So this fire that burned in the mid 1700s at this particular site, and this is from near Asheboro where the zoo is here in North Carolina. Uh, this fire was a winter fire in 1758. And you know, there's no other scars right here on the screen, but this tree did have other scars in other years. And then we also use again, um, many different trees to build this record of fire for a given location. So we have this work ongoing uh, at several sites here in North Carolina, Cliffs of the New State Park, uh, just about uh, a little over an hour north of Wilmington, a really nice place. The Uaris in the Piedmont and the Nichols Tract as well there, and Weymouth Woods uh, in the Sand Hills of North Carolina, which actually has our oldest living longleaf pine over 400 years old, really amazing there. So we hope to learn a lot more about the details of fire history and longleaf using these tree ring methods. Okay, so that's a, a little overview of my interests and, and these projects that I'm working on with many different collaborators. So I'll wrap it up there and I would be really happy to take any questions or comments. Thanks, Monica. That was an awesome talk and, and such a cool um, look into a different side of longleaf as far as research. Now, I have a question about um, how you guys are, are taking these the tree ring data. I know that some dendrochronologists actually take cores from a tree and count the rings that way. Could you explain the difference between your method and then coring a tree? That's a great question. Let me see. OK, I do have one right behind here to show you. So Michelle was asking about tree cores. So these are little pencil thin cores that I do collect these from live trees. And this doesn't hurt the tree. It does put a little hole in the tree, but the tree quickly heals it, heals it over and it doesn't, you know, decrease the chances of living for that tree. But we can't do this for the fire scar record because you're only getting one little radii of the tree, one radius of the tree. And we don't know for sure that we're going to go through those fire scars, which can occur all around the tree. So for fire scar work, and, and also if you're trying to reconstruct maybe beetle outbreaks, there's certain applications within tree ring science where we need that full cross section and we can't use the cores. But yeah, this is the bread and butter for a lot of tree ring scientists, these cores. That's awesome. Um, and, you know, you talked a little bit about the di biodiversity of longleaf and um, one great analogy that I'll, I always say is, you know, the Amazon rainforest, people often think of biodiversity, thinking about the rainforest and how diverse and colorful it is. And in longleaf, a lot of that biodiversity does live in the uh, shrub layer and the grass layer. A lot of these carnivorous plants are often very small and fire helps aid that a lot. Um, have you ever been on a prescribed burn? I have, yeah. Before I started uh, working as a professor here at UNCW, I worked at a research station called Tall Timbers down in Florida that focuses on prescribed fire. So I learned all the different 
safety precautions you need to take. And I did become a burn boss, as it's called, and got to light a few small fires myself that were being started for restoration purposes and also for research purposes to learn more about fire and longleaf by seeing how different applications of fire affect that system. Yeah, it is cool to have different careers within longleaf and fire, you know, and, and it's all interconnected. A lot of the burn bosses or folks that start the fire are often uh, biologists too, and naturalists and foresters and, and people who work in longleaf tend to have a wear a lot of different hats, I like to say. Yes. Um, Nathan asks, are you only looking for fire scars to determine fire regimes or can you also see rings of charcoal or soot or anything like that? Um, hmm. I'm not sure I quite understand the question. So looking for fire scars, can you see charcoal in the rings? Well, the scars themselves often have charcoal in them, but I'm not analyzing the charcoal separately. I'm not sure if that answers the question. I, I know that maybe you're getting at this. Um, other researchers take cores from lakes and, and from soil and analyze and date the charcoal um, using other methods. So sometimes we can collect charcoal from soil and um, sediments to, to look at fire history as well. Cool, awesome. So um, I, I want to speak briefly about Monica saying that there's less than, you know, you hear the 3% of longleaf remaining a lot and a lot of conservation work in the areas dedicated to preserving these natural spaces that we have left of longleaf and connecting these natural spaces. So um, it's not just one organization doing one mission. It's all about partnerships. We have so many organizations across the landscape that are working together to put fire on the landscape, as well as buy property to restore to a longleaf uh, natural system again. So um, hopefully that 3% can continue to increase and we'll continue to see a growth in longleaf populations. And also there's a lot of cool projects that are happening in surveying longleaf across the landscape to see really how, how much is left. It might be more than 3% at this time. So. Hopefully That's we'll a great that point. Yeah, I don't know if it's I don't know if it's counted or not. But for example, at Cliffs of the Noose, some of you might have been there, a beautiful state park. Um, it, they kind of always thought it wasn't a, a place of longleaf; that it wasn't naturally that way. But they're starting to find more and more longleaf, and also old stumps, including turpentine stumps, on that landscape. So there may be some places that you know were fire suppressed for so long, or they didn't have that fire they needed for so long that. Um, they might not even initially get recognized as being part of the longleaf system. Yeah, that is very interesting. Uh, we have another question. It's a double question. What made you want to focus on this area of research? And do you think your findings would help forest managers determine how often you should be burning? That's a great question. Yeah, excellent questions. Well, um, back in undergrad, I took a class that was all focused on fire. And this was in Oregon, <laughs> out west. But we camped. It was, I was an environmental science major and at a small school. We camped all over the state. And we spent time in areas that had burned. And my, one of my professors was a true ring scientist. So I was very interested in what she did and continued to pursue those interests after I finished um, college. In terms of whether the research can help, yeah, I hope so. I guess the only disclaimer that I give is that um, I don't want my research to be dictating exactly what happens. It's, it's a source of context or extra information to help land managers, but land managers already know um, so much themselves from their own data. As Michelle said, many of them are researchers themselves, but I hope that this information can give them a little bit more insights and also help with um, gaining some public support for what they do. So to help the public better understand the long history of fire to make it easier for them to do their prescribed burning. Great. Um, and a question I have, Monica, is in dating trees around this landscape, you said the oldest tree is in Weymouth Woods in the Sand Hills. In the coastal plain, how, what is the oldest tree that you've dated so far? 
I am just starting work in the coastal plain, um, but it's, it's definitely going to be trees from Cliffs of the Noose. So I was there on Tuesday and also last Friday. Uh, and we just from looking, we haven't yet done all of the tree ring dating, but just from looking at the course, there's definitely trees that are over 200 there. I'm keeping my fingers crossed that we'll go beyond that. Uh, on campus here at UNC Wilmington, you know, our trees aren't super old, but they're older than a lot of people think. And we're finding trees that are over a hundred years old right here on campus in our woods as well. Yeah, and I'm sure um, you've run into this a lot with dendrochronology. Not all trees that are big are old. Right. <laughs> so there's a lot of really old trees out there that are just stunted or small. Um, yeah. Now, somebody wants to know, what is your favorite tree? Really hard question. I mean, longleaf as well as ponderosa pine, those two species, they're our most... Uh, they're very fire prone species that have have a huge amount of fire on the landscape through time. So I love both of those species just because they're so fire adapted. But I do have a there's a special place in my heart for those trees that live a really long time. So cypress in, in the east can live for, you know, thousands of years. The oldest ones we found so far, a couple thousand of years, which is just stunning. And out west, the bristlecone pine in California can live even longer. They've, uh, I think the oldest one there is over 5,000 years old. And that just blows my mind. It's just stunning to think about. That is crazy. Yeah. And I think being around these old trees, you really have a sense of being small and being around these giants. Yes. Yes. What stories do they have to tell, you know? Right. What have That's they really seen? <laughs> what have they lived through? Um, well, you mentioned that you're doing a couple of projects around the state of North Carolina, but is there a way that people can keep up with this or do you have a sort of outreach platform? I, I'm starting to get more involved with that now. So for example, I'm, I'm doing a new project that's trying, talking about old longleaf, a new project that's looking for old longleaf all around Wilmington and New Hanover County. And I have an honor student that's working on that with me now and we're just coring trees on campus and at different parks. Uh, and we definitely want to do some some kind of big exhibit with that. We might do a museum exhibit with that or, or something at some of the public libraries. I also have a research website where I post photos and, and findings. Um, I'm not sure <laughs> what the link is to that. Uh, my main page, I could escape and look. Or, you know, if anyone is interested, why don't I put my email on here? And anyone is welcome to email me and I can share additional information about what I do. Oops, looks like you just chatted that to me. I'll go ahead and resend it out. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Well, Monica, thank you so much for sharing your expertise. This is such an interesting topic. And um, you know, the takeaway message for me is that fire's always been around in this landscape. It's not. It's not a new thing. It's it's all it's a natural part of longleaf pine ecosystems, whether it be started by um, nature through lightning strikes or stewarded along by indigenous people who who stewarded this land for many many years before we came. So, um, for me, the take home message is longleaf pine forests need fire, um, just like the Amazon rainforest needs rain, and. <laughs> I wanna thank Monica for such an awesome presentation, such an interesting presentation through this walk in time with Longleaf and Fire. Um, if you guys are local to the Wilmington area, we have uh, set up at Halliburton Park, Carolina Beach State Park and Stanley Reader Garden this Saturday and Sunday. We'll be having our fire engines out there, um, uh, nature walks, self-guided nature walks, tons of chances to win activity bags and prizes. So come out if you guys are local. And if you're not, we do have an iNaturalist scavenger hunt and photo contest as well. You can find more information on our website, fireinthepines.org. Thank you, Monica, for supporting Fire in the Pines and for a great presentation. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining. Really appreciate it. Hope you guys have a good rest of your week. Bye.